Yeah, welcome everyone to cloud computing and big data today. Uh, today we have a practical lecture uh, about deep learning techniques in clouds. And we will basically pick up the material that we learned in a more conceptual lecture in lecture six with the invited speaker, Gabriel Cavallaro, that introduced us to neural networks and then basically initial parts of deep learning networks, which is a very huge field. And of course, we could not cover everything. So we focused a little bit on image processing where our research group is quite strong in. We then heard uh, basically in the lecture seven that clouds and distributed environment really need distributed computing to train actually deep learning networks. And we will pick up also this today with a meaning and understanding of how are the different parameters and what do they grow so much because that is directly related to the computing capacity we need. And before we dive into this material now in this practical lecture where I show some examples how it works, let us review just what we did the last time, basically both of these lectures together. If you remember in very early lectures, um, lecture two, lecture three in your first assignment, we had basically a very limited model, the perceptron learning model. It was still a relevant machine learning model, a very old one, as you know, um, but still it does the job if the data is linear separable. The problem is today and basically in all the data that you have, which if it's not a toy problem, then you can say that the data is highly non um, interoperable. So they're separable. So you basically have a situation like the XOR problem you have over here where you know when you see this animation now there that essentially you never have a line that separates the green from the red because it's modeled after a neuron. So you basically have a kind of input vector uh, multiplied by different weights uh, summed up essentially linearly then you have still a linear learning model. And with this you are kind of limited. The interesting thing, however, we learned then from Gabriel, um, picking that material up that we learned in the early lectures, um, left alone logistic regression, which was interesting with adding a nonlinearity. We could see basically in lecture six that uh, we can combine artificial neural networks with having different neurons. And by these different neurons is essentially just a logical combination of these linear classifiers we know but by combining them in the very specific way that you see here on the bottom, uh, essentially uh, meaning essentially a really, um, yeah, very specific artificial neural network, a feed forward net, no recurrent connections. Um, there you essentially have an interesting setup that when you combine those small entities that are still in the 60s developed, you can come to very interesting uh, de decision boundaries. You see, you not only can solve the XOR problem, we have seen in the examples in lecture six, you can grow the network, of course, you can add more hidden layers, you can add more neurons in the hidden layers. So in this sense, you can create very interesting networks, although we have to be careful if we go too deep, and I will pick that up again, then we may be overfit. Um, and this is related to the amount and complexity of parameters I want to also convey today in the lecture. We will review after every step essentially those parameter set and why they are significantly growing. Another aspect which was interesting then going further and thinking about deep learning, what's the difference? So what is machine learning? What's deep learning? And you see there the interesting way of actually reflecting it a little bit in the terms of feature engineering versus feature learning. If you remember in the beginning, we had the flowers and we basically extracted features, a sepa width and petal width and so forth. But there's a manual human that has to prepare that. If you remember, we sampled, we kind of subsampled, we were working on the data, selecting features, and then we performed the classification. It was on the perceptron, it was working, very simple. And then we do some post-processing. We have shown basically the label that essentially, if you have really such a toy problem, essentially, then it works. Now, deep learning takes basically this feature learning inside the modeling. So we have seen in Gabriel and also in Rocco's lecture that essentially deep learning performs feature learning inherently. So a lot of these aspects where manual intervention from humans would be otherwise needed are gone now. However, we have seen it sounds promising. So now we have automated machine learning. We don't have to do anything. 
it's not the case. We have learned that actually the difference is also that you don't have a, just a typical classifier you put out of your toolbox. You have to create a specific deep learning architecture for a specific given problem. So if you have an image recognition problem that we discussed the last time, um, you have seen we could use convolutional neural networks while you may consider in time series analysis, for instance, completely different models. There would be, for instance, long short term memory, recurrent neural networks, much better choice than using convolutional neural networks. So you see it's adding the complexity, not anymore into the features maybe, but more in how we create those networks. And this is an open problem until today. Nobody really knows. And I will close the lecture today with this problem that nobody exactly knows how to do it. We have several network architectures now that, you know, stand the test of time, like ResNet 50, for instance, we also explained already. But still, it's interesting to every day see new papers, new uh, signs coming out with new network architectures. Now then we carried on on thinking about how we actually train those and we said always there's a model. Okay, there's a neural network. So what is the learning algorithm and this is back propagation and this back propagation did a forward pass through the neural network um, basically to get our why to see how good we are doing and it back propagates the error basically that we had obtained from this loss function and updating the weights. So you have always a forward pass and then a backward pass. In this, we have seen that we basically have a very simple iteration. We always want to go usually the, the kind of steepest course downhill. And for this, we had learned a little bit about stochastic gradient descent. We learned that we probably don't pick just one data point. We pick a kind of batch series of points. But still the point is that we have this loss function we want to minimize. So in a way it's a minimization problem an optimization problem to minimize here. And the interesting thing is really where, you know, the update of the weights happening, because when you computed all of this loss, as we say, from the so-called loss function, we change essentially the weights. And with this, you have really the training effect there. And you see here in the in other, um, uh, basically, uh, yeah, animation here, where I'm with the pointer, there are different optimizers these days. We will use today, for instance, also Adam. There's an investor of momentum. So things which adding a little bit of velocity to the downhill approach to not end up in local minima. And this is basically what we will also pick up today every now and then to explain it a bit more in a really, let's say, applied um, you know, learning scenario starting very small with a, let's say, multi-output perceptron before we end up with convolutional networks and in the second part today. A small hint also again for distributed deep learning. This is of course often hidden from users that use this. So there's a framework which is, as Rocco explained, maybe like Horovod integrated with five lines of code and uh, basically then the magic happens. So and there were different approaches to this. You could have data parallel options where the model is essentially in parallel existing to the different data elements and then will be separately trained. And at some point in time, there's a synchronization about the weights. And another is basically the model parallel in one approach where you basically uh, share the model, different pieces of the model with different devices. So you kind of cut off the model in different pieces and parallelize. And what we also learned is, and what is interesting maybe for modular supercomputing and aspects like this, that you know, at each of the devices has different strength. One is better for number crunching, for training. The other one is maybe better than for inference when you do the last step with a classification. So you have pipelining as another approach. And there's a good reference on the bottom right essentially where you have then uh, a very nice paper that describes a lot of these things. But let us come now, because we want to see also some demos, to a practical lecture today where we try to get all of this material where we normally and usually do three day courses from morning till evening uh, in three lectures. And you can imagine we cannot cover everything, but I do my best to put it in the clouds in a way you understand it and you can take this material then to your own problems. We will start basically with the things that Gabriel was explaining. So here and there, I will not cover any more much details about the artificial neural networks. This was already done in lecture six, essentially. So we focus a little bit more on the structure, on the network architectures, on the parameters and how we use it in the cloud in this lecture. 
And it's of course directly related to your assignment too. So it's good to have basically this lecture here looked at before you perform assignment two. We will start with the MNIST data set, which is admittedly a very trivial data set, but you will soon learn, even if you have a very cutting edge deep learning network for it and working on this toy problem, it could take some time if you have just CPUs. Hence, the idea of the whole lecture today would be also to think about the, the run times between CPUs and GPUs, why GPUs are the modus operandi, so to speak, for deep learning today, and we will experience this, as well as you will experience in your assignment too. So we start with the Elastic Compute Cloud from Amazon. We have used that already. We know that from Elastic MapReduce, but now we use it in a different fashion. We don't use MapReduce in this lecture. We want to use it with deep learning. And as soon as you start in deep learning, you will explore there are lots of challenges with it with different versions of tooling, frameworks, and the interesting approach that Amazon there has, it offers Amazon machine images for machine learning. And we will reveal this a little bit, also tackling with this a challenge of the different versions and software related to this. Then of course, we have to observe some limitations of the free usage tiers, just to let you know that of course, GPUs are not so freely available. And I guess everybody of you know why they are costly, right? So we will review the costs of the free usage tiers and when we all do this modeling in the beginning, ending up with a neural network with perhaps two hidden layers, we always will observe a significant growth from trainable parameters, starting from the multi-output perceptron, which is essentially a neural network with zero hidden layers, up essentially to one with two hidden layers. This is part one. And if you have then basically seen that CPUs can actually do that in the cloud and the Amazon machine images are quite nice for it. We do a short trick to get this into Jupyter. That's a little bit more complicated requiring SSH forwarding, but in the end it works. And then in the second part, we pick that up and we would see, okay, what if we really do deep learning with the AMI images? and using CPUs for it. And you will quickly see the massive growth of trainable parameters. Um, and we will discuss it a bit in the light of hyperparameter complexity as well. And then you will notice we don't really can use deep learning with CPUs or you have to be drinking a lot of coffee, right? So, and waiting a long time. And we will explore that basically before we then carry on to a different cloud provider that gives us some GPUs gratis. Um, completely gratis is, is, let's say, a way of defining it. It's, of course, um, you know, old GPUs, K80s, not the cutting edge A100s or V100s that you would find maybe when you buy it in the Amazon cloud, but it's still a very nice, um, let's say, way of getting people to the cloud using more and more also for trainings and is definitely an interesting environment. I end the lecture with this sort of um, cutting edge in science and engineering. Where are we? Uh, basically, lots of research goes into the direction of neural architecture search. So finding automatically, so to speak, the right neural network architectures. It's also a field called AutoML, and of course, uh, raises significant amounts of computing power requirements. With this, we have now basically everything fulfilled. We had uh, some of the promises from our previous lectures and um, let's get started with starting again with the neural networks with an application problem. So we said we had this MNIST data set and this is not new to you. If you remember and we're really on and early on in the case, I did some practical lecture zero one, essentially before we even started. We had Jupyter, we had a little bit Python examples, NumPy arrays, and we did a little bit of data exploration. And this was exactly on the same data set. So if you go back to practical lecture zero one, you will see we are back to the same data set, but this time we don't wanna just explore the data. We wanna first use it as an input for artificial neural networks. So more or less traditional machine learning methods. And then of course, we want to have it as an input for deep learning networks, which is of course here as an image recognition problem, if you remember, right? The idea was is to here to recognize the characters that are given in a small image. Then basically we are at convolutional neural networks that I will demonstrate today. The demonstration will of course start with our AWS Educate starter account. Um, for all of you that have started maybe with the assignment, um, please be aware that you really use the AWS console from that workbench on. And I will do a demo in a couple of uh, yeah minutes. Just remember that if you want to do anything in this Elastic Compute Cloud, 
right? And the AMIs, the images, the virtual servers that we already explored in lecture four with virtualization, this is all coming now to life in this practical lecture. So we need the SSH a key essentially to connect to these instances that we create. And I will do it step by step with you. However, I will not generate keys again and do everything because essentially this was what we did already in uh, practical lecture 5.1 if you remember. So it's the same process going to EC2, exploring the keys and you know creating keys, having your private key stored at your site, but the cloud knows about your public key. You could have their different ideas how to do it. Um, you can either do it with the uh, PPK file if you remember or also with a PEM. It sometimes it matters a little bit, depending also on the SSH clients, um, which key pair you generate there. Uh, in the end, it's just different formats for using and we could use both of them. Some is a PEM and some is a PPK format. So let us review that um, maybe shortly in a real environment. So again, I demonstrate to you here the AWS Educate what you also should use in your assignment. Again, it's important that you really use this way of logging into the AWS console. If you use your production one where you have your credit card, um, there is a complete different environment. It's disconnected from your other AWS account in a way, right? So please make the same step that I do here today. I go to my classrooms and you would have the same. Basically, we see that already 15 uh, students basically have joined um, and there's still 54 that could. And we go to the classroom and from the classroom, you come now basically to the idea of an overview of AWS Educate, where you then can pick the concrete workbench of the class, which would be here on the top, the cloud computing and big data, that's our course. And you will notice a difference compared to your production um, basically already with the with your ID. Of course, it might be the same email address, but if you use the AWS console as I do here, and you see here, I already burned some credits, but not many, and we will explore why there are not many. We go here to the AWS console, and you see essentially here this interesting voc start soft user. So you're a very strange user in a way. That's not normally. That is because we're in the educate environment. But the good news is then we don't have to pay, right? Of course, on the other hand, the drawback is we don't get all services. And one of the drawbacks is we don't really get GPUs. So thinking about what we just discussed, we have the EC2, um, the Elastic Compute Cloud as services uh, from the, let's say almost billions of services that are out there in, in Amazon that we had already explored in lecture 5.1. We have seen that here down there as interesting aspects about network security for us relevant here now is the key pairs, right? Which is Morris key pair uh, that I created here, but you can create your own as I was alluding to in lecture five one. So I not repeat here, you just see I have lecture, I have a key pair three and a key pair four. So the other aspect is in the EC2 dashboard, we can now um, launch instances, that's something different. That's something not what we done in the last time. There we did, you know, the Elastic MapReduce um, service, a complete different service. However, also based of course on the EC2 underneath. And here's an element where I want to demonstrate you just shortly how complex sometimes the setup of these packages is. For instance, this is a very interesting one. So you would have a specific OS, the Amazon Linux, but with you know, MaxNet 1.6, TensorFlow 2.3, PyTorch, all of these should now mean something to you from lecture six and lecture seven. So these are popular deep learning frameworks and they need to work together with the underlying libraries from NVIDIA with CUDA, CUDNN, specifically designed for supporting deep learning. We have Nickel and Intel libraries specifically designed to work basically with Intel. Uh, Docker is a technology we will come at the end of the lecture series more or less in this course. So we talk about containers more, but you see this is already a pre-packaged bundle together with the operating system, with the right set of packages that I need for deep learning. And you see here, you can have many of those, an Ubuntu version with OS, um, then maybe also different versions in the Amazon Linux with let's say older versions. And this is also why this interesting environment um, has a unique selling proposition compared maybe to Google Colab. Here you can really pick a bit more precise what you need, but of course partly you have to pay. 
In our case, you want just to have an example here, select this one, choose an instance type. You have learned that already in the lecture 5.1. Unfortunately, our free eligible tier here cannot now go to cutting edge GPUs and pick those. And you know why they would cost a lot. So we pick here the T2 micro and in fact, we have no other choices in the AWS Educate. But of course, normally you could now go and equip yourself as an AMI on a very powerful GPU if you have the money for it. When you review and launch this, um, there's a small hint that we are not eligible for this, but my tests still work in this direction that it does. So I have no exact idea why that is showing, to be honest. Sometimes it is like that in clouds, as you know from your first assignment, just carry on. The errors that are there sometimes may disappear or the resources become back again. So when we say here, essentially, um, elements we need to talk to later on, the security groups or so, we just have a launch of this. Uh, as you know from our other lecture, um, we need definitively a key for it. So let's take my key pair four. And I acknowledge that without the private key, I can never use that thing. So I basically launch into this, uh, you know, AMI instance now on one of these micro um, CPUs. While doing so, um, and we're waiting in the instances now, you see probably two of mine that has been stopped in preparing a little bit for this lecture and make sure it works. Um, we are now pending, so let's go a little bit to the slides until it's really up and running. The most steps I do, as you know, from the demos, from the, all the practical lectures I have, is somehow here on the slides um, and already known to you. We talked about TensorFlow and Keras already. Um, we picked here a specific one. We didn't need to necessarily had to do this. This is just one good example that I come later on with different versions of tool tooling, which is quite nice in this AMI imaging with different kernels in Jupyter. We have picked the T2 micro, of course. Look at the price here that they give us. You see it costs around one cent per hour. So you see we are almost at the, at the lowest. With this come several restrictions. You see here one gigabyte memory is also not really something you would put Spark on, right? So um, you see, of course, it's a free tier. Nevertheless, we can use the system and we can do some machine learning with it. And when you now launch it, we will see it takes some time before it's up and running, having a running state. The idea is now with this key that you have to log into this. So we need an SSH client like my MobileX term that you already know from one of my previous lectures and to log into this. However, the users here are basically root in the description of the cloud, but basically what you need to have is an EC2 user that I will demonstrate. You don't look into as root. And we also will use a specific trick to connect to a Jupyter notebook. So let's see if our um, uh, instance is up and running. You see here, basically it seems like that. So if we go into this, we have a running instance. There's an optimizer, which is not in the free eligible tier. That makes sense. But the running instance is there. So now we have essentially this AMI there. We have also a public IP address, which is nice. So this is something where we then could, for instance, SSH into, but we have to make sure, and that's always important now for all your assignment, make sure that port range 2.2, which is essentially the SSH port, uh, is open as an inbound rule. Otherwise, SSH would be not allowed to basically be used with this instance. It is there by default, usually, but I have seen some assignment answers in the previous years where for some strange reasons or default settings, this was not the case. So make sure port range 22 is open. Protocol does not need to be SSH. TCP is the underlying modus operandi anyway, but that's important. Right, and what we do now is starting now my MobileX term. Um, basically this SSH client, if you remember, I have the professional version here, but it doesn't matter. You can also use it in the non-professional version or use essentially also if you like the putty. I don't recommend putty as I said earlier because essentially it's very limited. And when we now see what we could do, um, we have a certain interesting command that enables us to lock not only into this AMI instance, what we also do is we prepare an SSH forwarding on a particular port here, 80, 80, you know, 8,888 to forward our Jupyter that is basically feels like being local and be executed remotely. 
right? It's a little bit complicated, not only just a click that we had in MS Azure, but it captures a lot of essence of infrastructure as a service because now you're really in control. You can do what you want. If you're not in control or don't want to be, go to AWS SageMaker. There you have everything like MS Azure. But now I show you a little bit another form of clouds, which is much more hands-on with SSH and just a little bit of it. We remember we have my key pair four picked here and the EC2 user is always the one that you use, but we have created a new instance. That means we basically should see here now what is the IP address of that instance and copy paste that into this interesting SSH um, client here because this is for instance something which is often not used or usable in PuTTY. And when we now execute this, uh, we have a very interesting setup that will be there created. Um, we are logging in, obviously, as you see, and you see why that is a unique selling proposition of Amazon right now. You see lots of old supported um, environments, which is very nice. Once you have your code, neural network code in Python, you would think portability is easy. No, it's absolutely not in machine learning. The problem is, as I described earlier, you have different versions of TensorFlow, you have different versions of PyTorch, with different versions of Python, based on different versions of CUDA, maybe QDNN. So essentially you have here a huge set of you know, work to do if you do it yourself. And also if you always want to be cutting edge, you always have to update your scripts. And of course, obviously we don't have the time to do it. Sometimes there are real benefits, of course, because we have more speed up when you go to new, let's say uh, CUDA libraries and so, of course it's good, but not every scientist or every engineer has maybe time to do it. Now being now on this um, remote machine, we can do an interesting setup now that we call the Utipper notebook remotely, right? So this is now a bit strange for I think some of you that not have been before in this, let's say very low level of, of, of computing. What's happening now is that we're opening, so to speak, or we have opened a channel with SSH, with this protocol, and having a permanent link. What we add to this was that we basically have on our local host, on this port 8888, now a forwarding taking place through that tunnel to that cloud and vice versa. So we really can interact inter interactively with this. And you see here in the backup, um, and there's lots of things starting. We have Lab that we had in one lecture and stuff like this. And when this is all through, you've essentially created now a Jupyter which is remotely accessible via this token. So you just copy paste this, um, STGC for instance, you can do that. And um, by this you could um, go here to the browser and edit it here. So if that already works, that would be good. And we see it works. Interesting enough, we are here on basically our 888-8883 and uh, have interesting, you know, this Jupyter Notebook environment around. So that is one way of doing it. And um, of course, there are several interesting aspects on the way. Uh, you see here, for instance, there's something um, fishy going on. So there could be one thing that is maybe going wrong. So here you can navigate a little bit with this Jupyter kernel, shut down this network server. So we could say maybe we want to execute here and stopping this app. And then I will do it again Oop, and close it here. So this will several times happening and you don't be basically afraid of this. You can create different ones, but be aware that of course the error is sometimes not in your, in your fault, so to speak. So here we may be starting a new one and I will also make a case later um, why you have to be careful on this again. For instance, seeing here that really this port can be used and bound, so it's not taken. So the kind of um, yeah, the thing that we just had that it crashed, so to speak, is not something you're completely worried about. So um, coming now back to this, adding it here, um, let's do some machine learning. Um, we have now essentially these things and we can upload those um, different notebooks. If you remember, I have also uploaded in our course, maybe doing some pre-processing here uh, in the cloud 
then we want to do essentially a neural network, a multi-output perceptron that we learned already about. And don't worry if, you know, you just have not the recording. I'll also explain more in the slides. But of course, the slides carry essentially the same essence I'm talking about right here, right? So essentially, when we go back to the slides, you will see um, the same idea we have here with the SSH minus L using your key. Of course, you always have to change your instance ID here. Look about the inbound rules. Um, once we have this started up, we can actually pick several different notebook kernels, which is a nice thing. So you can go back to older versions, um, which is particularly fruitful if you have, let's say, older scripts and you don't want to update uh, really often. Um, we have this idea, which, you know, has sometimes problems, dead environments in the cloud. You see here that the port 8888 is already in use. Try another port. So there, there are some problems that are particularly put in the course because you see that will happen regularly. And one of the reasons why that's happening is basically um, because we tend to do different things which we shouldn't. And one of these examples is the following. When we enter one of those, and you think here we're still remote, right? 127 is re localhost. But again, through this trick of SSH forwarding, we are remotely. So with this, we could also switch to another kernel remotely. Um, here is now a Python 3 kernel. Um, we could change to a specific kernel, basically Conda, Conda TensorFlow 2P27 or here, the Conda ten, TensorFlow P27. Uh, basically, you have different kernels that you can use in this environment. So when we go in there, one of the problems you could do also to, to really then mess up this is essentially that you, um, how to say, that you just stop basically by just um, clicking here X on the browser, right? So you're stopping here. And essentially, you, you just close everything. But the point is that um, you can't really do that. And basically, you should always do further this file and close and hold, right? So that's a very important aspect of it. And then it, you can close it and so on, stuff like this. And here you see an overview if it's really still running or not running and stuff like this. So this is also an important feedback for you, uh, whether you know there's something happening or not in this particular um, example. So let's look what's here happening. So we have a kernel shutdown, that's okay. So let's go there. Um, let's say we stop that for a while again and open it up again. So you see, you basically several now and then have, when you do a little bit of wrong, let's say, behavior here, the problem of, um, you know, not going right with the, with the idea how the kernel should work. But it's, in the end, it's not a problem. If it's really completely blocked and stopping, what I recommend for your assignments and working is stop instance, right? When you stop the instance and restart the instance and all the dead, let's say, you have the notebooks in the background, um, would be not basically accessible. So let's do that. So obviously I did something wrong and in the back, you know, it will keep being like that, which is all part of the plan. So don't worry. So the next time we will do something right. And now showing you the power of what you can nicely do, of course, of just going to instances that you have created already. Right. And when I now go, for instance, to this one, um, which we just had basically similar, it's, it's a AMI image, but of course a different public IP address. We can go to another one and starting that up. Um, and in the meantime, I just want to continue a little bit what we will now run in the practicals to use the time properly of the run up. So you see we had this um, training and test data set. Um, this is not new to you. We have this described already and looked into basically in practical lecture 01, where we just had these characters as basically these kind of numbers, uh, which are the gray value pixels. Now, when you execute this, what we'll do in a moment, you see it is uh, essentially looking like that, but we want to go one step ahead. And you learned essentially in, in Rocco's and Gabriel's lectures, we have to flatten, we have to vectorize. This is a two dimensional input, this image, but we have a one dimensional input for a neural network or perceptron structure. So 
what we need to do is to flatten and on the top of it, we need to normalize. It was also in Gabriel's lecture so that we're not ending up with multiplications of very large values, but rather small values. And when we want to execute now a 10 class classification problem, you see Keras offers really very nice uh, classes for this. You have essentially Jupyter Notebook, so you have essentially all the same code available for your assignment and go there. You notice all the parameters. We have 7,850 parameters here to be trainable. And of course, that's quite nice. You learned about that we basically compile in this multi output perceptron. We have an optimizer. Compiling means there will be a TensorFlow a graph essentially put behind it. And you learned already about the stochastic gradient descent, gradient differences from Gabriel. So I don't go into all the details. You know that multi-batches are in use today. And one emphasis on the epoch, so, because we will show you now basically in the cloud what the differences with this is. The longer you train in the epochs, you have basically seen in Rocco's uh, lecture, this could lead to overfitting, of course, also to more accuracy. So the question is where to stop there which is also, of course, good to be, uh, you know, basically realizing as part of your assignment. Now, when we now go to this um, multi, you now running a simple ANN without any layers, we have to basically shut this down here um, up and think about if the other one is already starting from the instances. Let's see this up. Just to make an update on this. So the second one is basically there and initializing, running, and we have here another public IP address that we can now SSH into with the terminal. I keep my key pair four, but I change essentially the computing that was there um, to this one. We are now logged in to the same basically idea of having an AMI. I have now this forwarding. I can use my Jupyter notebook here that I will start up a bit, right? As you see, interesting. It's not any more like click, 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 go, um, apparently. So with this, of course, you have an interesting um, way, basically, how to, how to get access to Jupyter, which is, of course, in other services, uh, not the case. There, it's a little bit different. Now, when we say we want to have this INN zero hidden, um, for instance, we should also see about the kernel ready here that it's, we can always do restart and clear output. That's what I would recommend to you before you start anyhow with any assignment or working in the cloud. Also, please wait until you know the environment is set up. We talked about this already with Elastic MapReduce and the star. Um, now it's executed. Now we can go forward executing now basically with 200 epochs um, this, but maybe we want to do it with 20 epochs and re-executing this is also not a problem because 200 epochs would be just too much time. But the difference in accuracy you essentially see on the slides as I just was explaining. You also see the total amount of parameters that is very little. And we've come in the second part of the lectures when we then want to use your neural networks and then also want to use convolutional neural networks, um, then basically we come to the point that these parameters will really, really grow. We compile a model that means the pen TensorFlow underlying graph will be prepared for execution. There's no execution yet. As you know from previous lectures, model fit is where it really starts. You have the timing before, and now we essentially start training the process of optimization. And you see, by basically with a CPU, which is admittedly very weak and you know cheap, we can still do the job. And we will see now in the uh, outcome after 20 epochs, our score is actually not that bad. It's 90% accuracy. And if we go back to what I had here on the slides and discussed with you, you see it varies a little bit because here we had 200 epochs. So we were training and training, but the more you train, you more or less overfit over time. Right, so this is a point where you don't reduce the error, you grow the error. And there is of course a problem of overfitting. So in a sense, the accuracy will go up again um, and, and still don't really does a job when you do it on real test samples. 
Right, now what could you do to do it better? Of course, more hidden layers, that's what we discussed. So let's see if there's really a big difference if you do that. Um, of course, Keras gives you dense layers for that and activation units that basically also Rocco and Gabriel were alluding to with the rectified linear units. Again, because it's a practical lecture, I not go again of explaining that all, but at least you have basically to lecture six and lecture seven here, the practical links to a tool that is putting that into practice. Here you see essentially when we now running this in the cloud before we break, we basically have to stop this. Now I do it properly. I will say firstly, um, essentially up, 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 close and hold here, right? You see, plum, it is actually stopping. So now I do the other one, A and N2 hidden that I have here. I do the same job. We see the kernel is ready, um, clear, restart, clear output. That's always important again. I will look uh -huh, here on the top right, I see kernel idle, that might be useful. And then basically you go, you in create here the TensorFlow backend again, you wait a little bit until the star is gone. And here we have now again, 20 epochs, we execute it again, we execute it again. We download the samples. You will notice in the assignment that only at the first time maybe it's downloaded because once you download it's available. But what you also see here and what is a major learning here through adding these dense layers, we add much more neurons, which are all interconnected heavily, right? With this, all the interconnected neurons and all these different layers have trainable parameters. So instead of a couple of thousand, we have now 120,000. So, and this is just keeps on growing and is essentially the computational problem. If you remember the optimization step, each of these weights, we have to add basically the new weight from depending on the learning rate and so forth. Now, when I do this with the CPU, you will see two hidden layers. It takes longer, 20 epochs, still okay in a way, right? So we see, um, although we have a weak CPU more or less, it's still good to go and we can actually work here nicely. We also get a relatively acceptable accuracy, which is of course important. There's no point of making it faster when we have a terrible accuracy, right? When we drop to 70%, but you see indeed we come to 94%. But again, if you would keep on doing this, and this is essentially what's here standing in the slides, you will simply overfit. You will see with the multi-output perceptron after 20 epochs, even after 200, you just get one or 2% more. With the INN with two hidden, you get also maximal, you know, 97% or 96%. So with this, we at the end, what traditional machine learning could do to improve the process. It's just not more possible. And we come back to this by using deep learning in the second part of the lecture.